It has been wonderful to be here with you this afternoon, today, all day. Appreciate the hospitality, the hands that prepared, and the hands that provided what was prepared. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for your encouragement. And I don't just mean the encouragement of your compliments. While those are very meaningful and they help encourage us to do what we do, uh, the encouragement of your listening goes far beyond the encouragement of your words. And the fact that you are such an attentive audience is encouraging to me. And if I ever go long, it's your fault. Just act forward and I'll cut it short. We're going to talk a little while this afternoon. My favorite way to teach, my favorite way to study, my favorite way to preach and hold meetings is what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to take a context of what's being said. Some people call it a chapter study. Others call it an expository study. I, it's a sermon. And I hope that by the time we're done, you don't look at it. If you came into looking at chapter studies or expository studies, like, oh, just, that's, that is so brutal. I hope you walk away from saying, now that's, that's what I want to do. My goal is to go through the study, and I know on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, a Wednesday night, you're preaching to the choir. You're preaching to people that are here all the time. Your faces are faces I am sure that you're used to seeing and most, if not all, the services. Some of your faces, I see at meetings that I travel and go to around this state. So I get it that you get it. But sometimes, as members of the church, no matter how many sermons we've heard, and no matter how much we thrill to hear the gospel, if it came down to us having to explain this to a stranger, we'd be like, oh, stop. I can't do that. And my goal through studies like this is to make you feel like, well, that's it. I can do that, because we can. You don't have to be a Greek scholar. You just have to be willing to spend time with the passage. Before I go any further in this, it's like, Greg, what's your... I've had people say, how do you come up with sermon topics? I come up with my sermon topics through my yearly reading schedules. I've tried back early in my day, sermon outline books, crash and burn. Why? Because I didn't understand the root of the thought. I just tried following an outline that somebody else had done, and that was their mindset. I didn't get it, but I would try to present it, and it was crash and burn to me intellectually and to the audience like you intellectually. And what I found is when I really can enter into a passage and say, wow, I get that. I needed that. And then I share that with other people, and they say, yeah, I didn't know it was that simple. If we walk away today and you say, I get that, I could have done that, we didn't need him to come tell us that, then I've done my job. Because it puts you to know the word of God. God has told Jeremiah, he says, I'm not a wilderness. I'm not a land of darkness that I'm impossible to find. I have manifested myself to you in light. If you believe me, you'll get it. With that in mind, 2 Peter chapter 1, the beginning of the book, Simon Peter, an apostle servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained light, precious faith with us by the righteousness of God, our God and Savior Jesus Christ. He says who he is, and he says who he's writing to. He's writing to a group of people like I look out when I see you, people of light, precious faith. Not of our own righteousness, it's by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We all have that in common. Nobody in this audience today, present, myself included, can say, I really deserve this opportunity. I deserve this platform. I don't. Any more than anybody else does. But the point is, we don't have to. It's by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. May God's grace be multiplied to each and every one of us. How are we going to get that grace? It's going to come through knowledge. Just any knowledge, like self-help books? No. It's going to come through a biblical, a gospel knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This is an excellent follow-up study to what we studied this morning. Because this morning we all came into agreement that the word of God was not just given by these men. We need more than just the words in bread, right? We need all of these words. Why? Because they come. This is what gives us the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power made it possible. It was His Holy Spirit. 
His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We come to church to find out how to be godly, usually. We come to church to find out how to be good Christians. But do we ever stop and think this is going to teach us about life? This is what it's about. It's about how to go from today and live this week, life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. You're getting more than just spiritual blessings if we'll totally buy in. By which, by the same word, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, getting rid of this sin and following and committing to what Jesus has tried to reveal to us does more than just make us acceptable in his sight. That alone would be enough. But it's greater than that. He says we can escape the corruption in the world. Notice you get up, brother, and check outside. Some places have to do that. I'm not sure why he did it. Some places have to do that because they're going to look every once in a while because people will be breaking into cars. Our brethren in this state, they have to have cameras, and somebody has to keep them an eye on it during services. Because people will break into cars while you're in here, we're in here, God's people are worshiping. Corruption, it's in the world. Where's that come from? It comes from lust in somebody's heart. That they want what other people have because they think they're entitled to it or because they just think they can get it. The heart of the thief, it's how you explain that. If you've ever struggled with the temptation, you know. If you never have, you don't get it. But it's real. It's corruption. It's in the world from lust. He says the word God pertains to life and godliness. Godliness teaches how we can live in faithful service to God in a way that we please Him. And we'll be pleased, He'll be pleased. We can have a better life, too. In fact, there's a scripture that goes on to say, time out. That when we learn to work with our hands that which is good and be thieves no longer, not only will we have what we need, we'll have to give those who are in need. A beautiful way to approach lies. Verse 5, but, but also for this very reason, besides the fact we're going to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust, there's more. What would you pay for this? The infomercial? Nine, nine, don't answer yet. There's more. He says, besides this, for this very reason, giving all diligence, literally some translations say, making every effort, add to your faith virtue. Faith, it's assumed, brings us to this point that we see the benefit, that we see the value. He says, besides this, give every effort to add to this faith virtue. What is virtue? As I understand it, it comes from a Greek word that literally means goodness. Add to faith, be a good person. You're like, well, surely people of faith would be good people, right? According to James, remember what James said? He says, you believe, you do well. Even the devils believe in truth. Belief alone, this level of faith only that doesn't add goodness to it, it puts you right on a starting plane with the devil. Difference in the devil, a devil, is they're not good. He says, you add goodness. Besides faith, besides the fact you're going to believe, you'd be a good person to add to this goodness, to this virtue, knowledge. Why? Why do we have to go back to the knowledge? And I believe contextually he's drawing us right back to the Word of God. Because the year 2023 isn't the only time you can Google and get YouTube or any other amount of documents on people's life view, their worldview on what to be good. And they're all over the place, right? Some of them to even include breaking into cars. That's not the way it is with the Word of God. He says, besides this, add to your faith goodness, goodness based on knowledge, knowledge to this knowledge that you learn the goodness, self-control. If you're a King James fan, temperance. If you're a knife fan or collector, you know the value of a tempered blade. Holds an edge longer. It's not soft. Make that same application to your faith. To this goodness that's based on a knowledge of God, add self-control, add discipline. You're going to do it. 
You're not just going to know it. You're not going to be one who looks at his mirror, as James says, of your face in a glass and turn around and forget what you saw. You're going to be a doer of that work. Add to this self-control, to self-control, perseverance. The King James, I believe, says patience. You're going to keep going. Why would it be significant that he says add perseverance or patience? Because we as a whole, or many of us, are impatient. We're impatient for sure with other people. Now by this, I want us to apply it to ourselves. I also want it to apply to how we treat other people. Some of you, I need to tell you to be patient with yourself and persevere because you beat yourself up more than anybody ever could. Others of us need to be told to be patient with other people because we hold them to a different level of expectation. And we've even been able to. He says, you take and you add to your faith goodness, goodness based on the knowledge of God, goodness that you're going to be disciplined, self-controlled with, that you're going to be persevering with, and to perseverance, godliness. Time out again. Does it not strike you odd that godliness is so far down this list of ads? First time I studied this, first multiple times I read this, my favorite way to study is just read it and read it, and if I don't get it, what do I do next? I start reading other translations than the one I'm reading. It used to be a book, 21 translations, and there were three columns in the book. I mean, the book still exists, but I don't know where to get it right now. But there would be three columns. There was a King James, and then there would be two others down, and it would try to provide out of 21 different translations the best variety of interpretations of that verse. Awesome book. Over and over, and see if this starts to play. You know what? As I've just read and read this, it's like it made sense. If I think I'm going to try to be a godly man, if you think you're going to be a godly man or a woman, but you're not first willing to add to your faith goodness, goodness based on a knowledge of God's word that is willing to be self-controlled and persevere through it, the chances of ever being godly is like, not nah. Godliness comes as a result of this commitment to this process that we're being introduced to by who? Well, somebody says, if the Apostle Paul to the young evangelist Timothy, yes, but who is Paul influenced by? The Holy Spirit of God teaching him these things. Now, whether this was something, well, we know it. he didn't learn it in the three years with Jesus. He was one born out of your time. So he's learning this either through from those apostles or directly through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is certainly encouraging every single breath of these words. To perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness. Now, I'm starting to get it by now. And then I had three boys. Good boys they were. I won't complain a bit about them. But did they fight? Yeah, they fought. They loved each other. They were good kids. Be kind to one another was one of the last things they got really good at. It's a sign of maturity. Now, let's apply this to the church. Let's take it away from just Greg's family your family, and apply that to the church. I know brethren, diligent, faithful brethren, it seems like to me, have a knowledge. I would hate to debate them. They're self-controlled as far as I can tell. They persevere, good, godly men, but they will not, I don't know any other way to say it, they wouldn't give a plug nickel for some of the prayer. Plug nickel is those in those electrical boxes that you knock out, so that you can put the wire through it, that's what we call a plug nickel. I don't know what they really are, but they're about the size of a nickel. If you file them off right, they might even go in some of those little twist point off things. But they're just a piece of metal. They're not worth anything. And that's where some people are about the bread. <clears throat> you would think they would know how to treat each other, but their hardest get along with some of their brethren. He says... If we're going to try to add brotherly kindness before we've added these other things, we might be getting the cart before the horse. And a brotherly kindness, love. Now, I won't get off on love, 1 Corinthians 13. But here's what I know. I will never be able to exercise love the way God intends the church and a leader and a Christian to love 
to lie and growing in all these areas. Do I think we have to master one of these areas, never get to love? I'm not saying that. But I'm saying this is a constant add to your faith list. That we don't become complacent. We don't decide, I made it. Even when we are critical to the church and we are an integral part of the church, if we ever think, I deserve it now, I've made it, and I'm the example, then I have now lost touch with reality. But if I can always remember that I'm in this growing add to list, I have a hope to get to where I can experience love. For if these things, he's just talked about it, you say, Greg, I'm like, that's a great lesson, you got my attention so far, but is it really that big a deal? If these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes I stop myself and I see the antithesis before I even decide what it means. And what I saw when I first looked at that was, you know what? You can have knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ and be barren and unfruitful. It doesn't matter how much you know. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Back up. So what's he saying? He says, if these are yours, if you will abound in these, you won't be barren. You won't be unfruitful. So he says, why isn't, why don't I have, why won't people come to church? Why won't this, why don't I feel more fruitful? Two, two options that first come to mind. Number one, where do you need to grow here? It's got to be something right here. Number two, sometimes we think we're unfruitful because we're not looking at what's growing as a result of our efforts. I told some of you today, I'd love to garden. Not like in the flowers and stuff, I like stuff I can eat. Like tomatoes, like vegetables, like all that stuff. You ever have that those tomato plants that you just do everything to, and it's just for some reason it's not doing it. Put on the blossoms, and it never really. I'll have seven others that are knocking it out of the park, but I'm frustrated because of that one. That happens to our in our relationship spiritually. We get our heart and our mind set on a project or a person, and we cannot see the fruit that's growing around us. Second thing that goes with that plan could be <laughs> is generally when people say they're not fruitful, they usually mean I've never been a part of anybody's baptism, but that's a result of my efforts or the restoration to the church. And so they say that's fruit. All this to draw your attention to the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long suffering. We can be fruitful. All we're told is that we are to plant and water. I have planted, Apollos watered, Paul says. God gave the increase. Be careful that as we look for fruit, that we're not holding our standard, ourselves to a standard God didn't place before us. If we're adding to our faith, like he says, we will be fruitful, we will not be barren, and we will not be unfruitful in our knowledge. But for he who lacks these things, the opposite side of this, if we lack these things, we're short-sighted even to blindness and have forgotten he was cleansed from his old sins. Rachel and I lived in Slide at one point. At that time, my glasses were for seeing things that were far away. I was nearsighted. Now I had LASIK, and now I needed to read. I can't do it without them right now, but if I go back to my book, I need this right back on. So when I was nearsighted, sitting there at the desk thing, what's that talking about? I'm nearsighted. He who lacks these things is short-sighted. The NIV says nearsighted and blind. I'm like, I'm not blind, I'm nearsighted. So in the context of this, pa this passage, whoever lacks these things is short-sighted, nearsighted, even to blindness. What's he talking about? Put it back to Rachel and I. Many of you know I grew up in Oklahoma. Was studying the summer of 1986 out here with Glenn Ballard that she and I started dating, and I decided I got to be a Californian. Back to college, finished, and I didn't even stick around to get my diploma. I was out here in Melbourne to little. <laughs> Can you imagine, as a nearsighted Greg Branch, would I have ever made it to California? Nope. Why? Because it's, it was a blur out there. You get it. I could read. I could have a whole life within about two feet of my face, but you get out to the front end of my pickup and I wasn't safe to be on the roads. 
I would have never made it to California. I would have never recognized and been attracted to her from across the room because everything across the room was blue. But when you can see and get rid of their sightings, it opens up a whole new world. That's exactly what those add to your faith things do to you as a Christian. They take everything from being right here and they show you a whole new world. He says you lack those things. That means you're short-sighted and blindness. Why? Because it makes you forget that you've been cleansed from all that junk. You forgot how bad sin is. You forgot where it comes from and that you've been delivered from that. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. He started out by saying give diligence to add to your faith. Now he says Knowing this, you've got to be more diligent. It's never enough passion to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now somebody says, are you saying that makes me perfect? No. Then how are you not going to stumble? Because when you're adding to your faith through the word of God and you're persevering, you're going to find out when you sin, you don't just give yourself a pass. You confess that sin. And you pray to God and he'll forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. And then you just get right back at it. It's the relentless pursuit. That's what faith is all about. It doesn't turn us into these robots that never make a mistake again. It turns us into people that know to turn back to our God immediately. And you know what? Somebody says, yeah, I don't know. I just keep doing it. If you keep following this pattern and repenting and relentlessly pursue faith pretty soon, you're going to be repenting about the time you're starting to think about doing it. That's the point. It changes us from the inside out. You won't stumble. For so an interest will be supplied into you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the road back to heaven. That's what he's telling us. For this reason, Peter says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. This is an easy selection this Sunday for me to think. I, I don't know when I'll come back again. But if I don't come back in a long time, I'm saying I'm going to remind you this when I get a chance. I probably won't preach it again if I came back very soon. But Oakdale gets it on a regular basis. I will not be negligent to remind you of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. I'm not preaching this today because I don't think you know it. As far as I'm concerned, you're established. But Peter knew that about them, too. Yes, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. He's living in a tent. Why do you have to bring that up? Well, he's not actually talking about a tent. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. He refers to his body like a tent. Oh, if I could only simplify my view of life as just a tent life. And not be afraid of death. Not be afraid of what's on the other side. It's just a tent. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about his life. What do we do with tents? Well, we're going to pack. Half the time I leave my at home, just carry a tarp. It's my tent. Do a heavy back. This life is certainly not what it's about. This is not, what do they say, the end, the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. He says, I'm not, I'm about to die. What does somebody tell you on their deathbed? Is what Peter has to say. Ooh. I forgot why I did this, but we're just going to put them all up there. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He says, I told you about Jesus Christ. He says, I want you to know. We can just make this up. We were eyewitnesses. Apparently, by this time, there were already charlatans that were acting like apostles. He says, we were eyewitnesses when he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were, when we were with him on the holy mount. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, we didn't make that up. We were there. We heard it. It was amazing. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. What's he talking about? Under the old law, they had prophecy confirmed. He said, this was prophesied, it was prophesied, it was prophesied, and then it happened, and we were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. We didn't make that up. 
It confirmed everything we knew from previous scripture, which you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Talk more about this as we close. But there's an alternate thing. If you're reading King James, verse 19, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Instead of saying we have the prophetic word confirmed, King James says we also have a more sure word of prophecy. And I understand it can be, it's, they're not sure. Most people go with the first translation, but some with this. Now that's a fascinating thing to me, because think of this. If this should be translated, we have a more sure word of prophecy, what's that say? Think to the previous verses. He says, we didn't make it up. We were eyewitnesses on the Mount of Transfiguration. But we have something even more sure than that. The word of prophecy. You know what I do know? I told you already, I'm a football fan. We can all watch the same game. And one person will say, oh, that was a penalty. And somebody will say, no, well, that's a clean hit. Somebody will see two people see a car wreck. And somebody will say, well, this is why. And say, no, it was this. Two people see the same thing. Somebody's wrong. If this should be a more sure water prophecy, what he's saying is he's got something he can trust more than what he saw with his own two eyes. And that's the word of prophecy. Now, whether that's the way this should be translated or not, I'm not totally convinced, but here's what I do know. This translation has helped some people. We've talked about today, we've discussed mental illness, mental issues. There are people that struggle with what's going on inside here. And they can read the Bible, intellectually know what the Bible says. But fact is, when they get over here, they're still, it's a problem. And there's a battle, there's a war going on inside. And what if you deal with that, what I want you to know is that you can trust the Word of God more. You can trust what your brain is doing to you. Every time, anytime. My late father-in-law, Howard Cole, and I were sitting studying with a lady in Salina. We did not endorse. And so we had a chance to study with her, and this has been 30 years ago at least. And we're sitting there and she's, we're going along and she's, okay, I got one for you. I, I need you guys to help me with this. And she began to describe an evil spirit that comes into her room. And that has taken over the house and her son and his drug issues. And I'm kind of speechless. I'm going to, I know. And I look at Howard. You know what Howard did? He turned in the King James to this verse. He says, here's what I can tell you. We have a more sure word of prophecy than what you can see with your own, what you think you're seeing with your eyes. You can put your heart in this. You can put your trust in this. And you just trust the word of God over what you think you're seeing. That gave her comfort. It gave me comfort. After over 30 years, I see this as an altar alternate, perhaps, translation of that verse going on. Know this verse, though, about all the things he just said. We're going to get back to what he says in the last part of this verse, but he says we need to know something first about it. Know this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Literally means one's own release. Peter says, this isn't coming for me. This isn't my private interpretation. Of, uh, Previous. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So you got to know this first. What the Bible says, it's not just what some guys were thinking. These people did not tell us their own will, but they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. If that's true, we can trust it. And we do well to take heed that's like it's a light in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Do you know every night, I told you I like to backpack and it's probably one of the still the thing the boys and I do the most. Now they have their own families doing their own thing and we'll still take carve out at least three times a year just go backpacking for a few days. You know there's a star that's the last one in the morning there. Bright and morning star. Interestingly enough, the scriptures speak of Jesus as the bright and morning star. But I can't tell you which one it is in the middle of the night. Some experts can. I just see a sky full of stars. It's pretty incredible. But not much help if you're looking for the one true one. 
you just gotta keep you got to keep staring till my day breaks and it's the last one to stand. He says, you'll do that with Jesus Christ. Yeah, it may be when you walk out of these doors and this week you get back into life and you're like, I know we, we're good people over at the church, but really is that the only place Jesus is? is? Where do I find Jesus? He says, you look at the word of God like it's the only light in a very dark place and the day will go and the day storm will rise in your heart. This is where Jesus is going to come up in your heart. Emotionalism and some of the things on YouTube might make us feel good and get us all pumped up, but it will not cause the day storm to rise in your heart. The Word of God will. And He said, You take heed to it like it's the only light in a dark place. I can't. I can't create that environment this afternoon. It's just too bright. We can turn off every light and light from the outside and still be coming in. But if you can just imagine with me, go back with me. About 43 years, 44 years, maybe 45. I was about 12 years old, I think. Capitol Hill Congregation in Oklahoma City, a building just maybe a hair wider than this, set up a lot like this with pews. Alton Bailey, it would be Alan Bailey's late dad, if you know Alan, was preaching in Oklahoma City. It was one Friday night, I believe, the house was packed. Probably the building went back again 50% further, packed with people. And we had tornado warnings in Oklahoma City that day. And during services, somewhere in the middle of his sermon, a big clap of lightning hit, and the lights just went out. Pitch dark, it's black outside, except for lightning occasionally. You could hear the rain just coming down, and the cars would go by the streets. You can almost hear it washing over the curb. Alton, he just kept preaching. In my 12 year old ears, I could just, it was commotion, wrestling. The brother got up and walked out, and carried the door shut pretty soon. He comes back in with a flashlight. I remember, I can just see me turning around and watching him all the way down the aisle until he sets it up on the pulpit. And Alan stopped long enough to say, well, good brother. That's thank you, brother. <laughs> and just went to preaching. You know, the lights came on before services were over. But I didn't have a clue at what point. The only reason I know the lights were on is because when the invitation was extended that evening, this row on this side filled up and was full of people. There was a couple of people sitting on this side. They had to get up and go stand at the back as this side filled up with people. Alton might have said, let's sing one more verse. I don't really remember, but I do remember before the invitation song was done, my aunt and uncle and their five kids had to get up off of this row and go stand at the back as the second row filled up with people. Some baptisms, mostly people just wanted to get their life right. What was different from that service and every other service? The only thing I can remember is we were all forced to listen to the Word of God like it was the old light, a dark place. And it made a change. Today, if I can reconstruct that in my mind, if I can reconstruct it in yours and say, what does it take to turn our heart back to God? And then this is the God that's here every moment of every single day. It says, you can see me if you want to see me. <laughs> if you're here this today and you have never obeyed the gospel, we talked about it this morning, we come believing that he's the Christ, the Son, the living God, being willing to accept and change our life. That's repentance. Being willing to confess him before men and be baptized. We've done that, but we've fallen away and we want the prayers of the church. You don't have to come up now and tell us. You know if you need to make that change and make it today. But if we can be of assistance in that, we won't. And we invite you as we stand.